So while I'm thinking about it, uh, when we were uh, as making some announcements, and I forgot that May has this extra Saturday in there. So uh, our work day is the 22nd. There is a Saturday in between the yard sale, but uh, you all knew that because you're looking at calendars, not doing it from the top of your head like me. Oh, by the way, uh, for the yard sale, we not only could we use folks just stopping by to be friendly, we could use some help. Uh, we're going to need people helping with setup and with uh, traffic control and, and a number of things. So if you think you could be available that Saturday and you're willing to help out, I'm going to invite you to reach out to uh, Ben's wife, Alicia, Alicia Osborne. Uh, and if you don't have her contact information, you can reach out to me. You can, again, email us at info at Crossroads, and that'll get forwarded. Um, but uh, if you'd like to offer yourself as a slave for the day, she will take you. Okay, so uh, I want to make sure that I mention that. So we're in a series of messages, uh, The Good and Beautiful Life. It, what preceded this was another series of messages, as you know, The Good and Beautiful God. And in that series, we learned that the stories we tell ourselves are more important than we might have first thought. That the narratives that play in our head have a huge impact on how we live our lives. And the stories that we tell ourselves about God have the biggest impact of all. Sometimes we don't even articulate them, and yet we have this nagging hunch that he's upset with us or angry with us or he's ready to get us back or whatever those narratives are. And so in that first series, we looked at things that Jesus said about his heavenly father, the God that he knew and how the narrative that Jesus shared was so different from some of these false narratives that we tell ourselves. Now, the good news is that because we have a good and beautiful God, it is possible to enjoy a good and beautiful life. And that's this series now. But what we started out, as we started this series, I I just want to remind you that what we said was that when God says a, a good and beautiful life, when he offers that, he's not talking just about spiritual things. If you've been around church, you know all those, it's what matters is what's spiritual I keep doing that. I don't know why, but I I think you get the air quotes, right? So somehow the things that are spiritual are important and and other things like our emotions are not important. They should simply be ignored or stuffed or, or, you know, pretend like they don't exist. And so the premise of the good and beautiful life is this idea that we cannot be spiritually mature while we remain emotionally immature, which explains why so many times we as Christians, those of you that have trusted Christ as your Savior, you begin to grow as a disciple. And you can probably go back, if if you thought about it a minute, you can go back to a spot where it seems like you just stopped growing. For a while, you felt like you were growing and learning, and and then all of a sudden, and, and it doesn't matter how many more sermons you listen to or how many books you read or prayers you pray, you feel like you're not moving forward spiritually And often, not always, but often it's because we have moved as far forward spiritually as we can, but to go further, we need to do some growth emotionally. And so we're addressing things that Jesus said, interestingly enough, about our emotions and how they can line up with the life that is good and beautiful. So we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is instructing his followers what he intends their lives to be like when they live in the kingdom of God. And his first point was simply this, that that kingdom is closer than you think. Now, I spent a lot of time thinking, oh, of course it is. It's like in my heart, you know, one of those little songs you just sing as a kid. Flag flies high in the castle of my heart, right? Right? But I think Jesus was talking about something a little bit more substantial than just him reigning in our hearts. The fact of the matter is the kingdom of God exists now. His rule and reign exists now. We can live like we're in it. And Jesus said that those that are in the kingdom experience things that otherwise we don't. Remember, happy are those, happy are those, happy are those. That's how he started the Sermon on the Mount. 
So the next lesson we learned just a couple of weeks ago was that it is possible when you're living in the kingdom, it is possible to live without anger. Not, not all anger, some anger is healthy. Anger sometimes is the only correct response to what is evil. But the kind of anger that eats at us, the kind of anger that doesn't do anybody any good, Jesus said, it is possible for us to live without that kind of anger. And if you want to know how, go back a couple of messages in YouTube and watch that again. Then last week, we said that Jesus also said it was possible for us to live without worry. And for some of us, that's mind-blowing. <laughs> we admitted that sometimes um, worrying feels like the only thing we can do, right? And what's so funny about worry is, is it sort of reinforces itself. If we worry about something and nothing goes wrong, we don't say to ourselves, well, then why did I bother worrying? No, what we say is, it's a good thing I worried as much as I did. Whew, man, you know, I barely kept that thing at bay. And, you know, next time I better worry more. And, and if you've worried about something and then it goes bad anyway, well, then I, I got to double up on my worrying, right? It just feels like it's the only thing we, we can do to, to feel like we have control. And Jesus kind of looks at us and says, why, 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 why would you want control? When the Heavenly Father has it, why would, you, why would you even reach for that? Well, anyway, we can live a life without anger. We can live a life without worry. Guess what Jesus said in that Sermon on the Mount? As soon as he was done talking about worry, guess what he talked about next? Well, let's find out. If you have a copy of the Scriptures, open it to Matthew chapter 7. And in Matthew 7, 1, he says this, do not judge or you will be judged. It is possible to live without judging others. Now, have you ever had somebody throw this at you? If they do that, it's usually not, it's, they don't mean it in a good way. You know, you approach your neighbor and you go, what are you doing? And he goes, ah, don't judge unless you want to be judged. You know, you're like, but you mowed over my hedge. I mean, you know, come on, you know? And like, but oh, oh no, no, no. And it's kind of like, oh, it's like protection, like the shield. Like, like ah, 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 don't judge. Okay, but, but what you did, that was terrible. I, I, don't judge, right? Somehow they throw it up like a defense. So the, before we can talk about this, we have to, again, make sure we know what we're talking about. And so let's contrast for just a second, judging whatever Jesus is talking about versus assessment or evaluation. Now, the truth is, we all know that assessment and evaluation, they're generally good things. They're necessary things. We all do better with some evaluation or for some input. It's always funny. We're, we're better at giving it than receiving it, but that has to do with what Jesus is going to say next. But evaluation and assessment and examining, that, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what Jesus means when he says, don't judge. He's not saying don't have an opinion. You, you do know, right, that words have more than one meaning. One of my favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton, uh, he was a pastor as well as an author. If you've watched the Father Brown series, the mysteries, he, he, wrote, the begin he wrote those, uh, or at least the, the, the foundational characters. G.K. Chesterton said this, the word good, as a matter of example, the word good has many meanings. For example, if a man were to shoot his grandmother at a range of 500 yards, I should call him a good shot, although I may not call him a good man. <laughs> All right? So what does Jesus mean when he says, don't judge? He's not talking about the kind of judgment where it's an honest, healthy evaluation. What Jesus is talking about is this. He says, judging is a negative opinion of a person's character and worth based on, only on outward observations. Now, those observations can include like attitudes and, you know, rolled eyes and all those kind of things. But it, the point is, we can't read someone's mind. We can't see their heart. So we develop a negative opinion of their character and their worth by what we see. Now, there's a false narrative in our culture. 
And uh, it says that correction by criticism works. You may not have thought about this, but often we think the best way to correct something is with criticism. How many times have you been tempted? Like, you know what? I'm just going to tell them what I think. I'm, I'm no filters. The filters are down. They're going to have to deal with it. Like, and we're, I'm just going to let them have it. You know, I'm going to tell them where they're wrong, and then they're going to have to correct it. It's like, it's like a drive-by judging, right? <laughs> and, and let me ask you something. Does it work? How many times have you just let somebody have it, and they went, oh, thank you so much. I had no idea I was doing it, and I had no idea it was affecting you negatively. Never again. <laughs> it's not. That's not how it usually goes. It almost never works, and yet we keep thinking it will. Now, there are reasons why correction by criticism doesn't work, and, and I'm just going to kind of tick off a few of them, and there are probably more. This is an exhaustive, and if you're taking notes, you see a couple little bullets there. You can write these in. They're very tiny lines, however. So why does correction by criticism fail so often? First of all, it's because it's a shortcut. It skips a step. Everybody kind of subconsciously knows that before someone can make a correction, an important correction, they need to recognize and admit that what they're doing now isn't working or isn't the best. The first step is self-awareness, a recognition. And, and when we try to correct someone by criticism, we skip the fact that they haven't noticed it themselves yet, right? Or we just assume, well, if you haven't, I'm going to let you have it, you know? And, and, and it's almost like we're forcing them to skip a step and go right to the next step, which is correcting it with an appropriate amount of apology, by the way. Drive-by judging tries to force a person to make a change long before they've actually seen their mistake. Now, don't get me wrong. I've known a few folks where it's, it can be excruciating when you're waiting for them to realize something, okay? But criticizing as an attempt to correct them backfires. In fact, usually what happens is they feel attacked, and then they either get defensive or they attack back, and what it was that you were hoping they would notice about their behavior is now they're even more distracted than ever. The second reason crit, uh, correction by criticism fails is because it's kind of like deconstruction without a reconstruction. I don't know if you've noticed, but people do the things they do for a reason, good or bad. Sometimes it's like, well, that's what my parents always did, or that's what we always did growing up, or that's the way I was. It's, but the, we learn patterns, and before we can expect someone to make a, a big shift in a lifelong pattern, before we can deconstruct what they've always done, we might want to help them imagine a new plan, a new reconstruction. But instead, we're kind of like taking something, tearing down the house without having someplace else to live. So there's a reason, and, and we're, we're pushing them when we correct by criticism. The third point is simply this, that they can usually tell that our criticism is not coming from a place of love. How do they know? They probably could look on our face, right? We skip all the niceties, we skip all the good things, and we just jab them with what's bugging us. And sometimes it's so bad that they might even be ready to go, well, and we go, okay, okay, and we march off. <laughs> we just wanted to deposit that and leave it as their problem. And the last reason that correction by criticism fails is because our judgment may be mistaken. In fact, it often is mistaken. Have you ever had that experience where you're like, how could you, and then you hear why, and you go, I am so sorry. I remember a story that I heard, and it's, it's out there all the time now, but I remember the first time I read this, uh, and I was, a, I was a young parent myself, and so how you parent and how your kids behave in public was important to me, and of course, I was about to write a book on parenting anyway, because we were doing everything right, and... Uh, I'm so glad. Thank you for not letting me write that book. <laughs> oh, gosh. 
And it was a story about a guy who got on a bus, a city bus, with these two small kids, and he basically sat down on a bus and put his head back and was pr pretty much asleep, not even watching where the kids were. They were crawling on people. They were talking. They knocked things over. They run up and down the aisle of the bus, and they were just really acting out. And the people on the bus were like, and as I'm reading it, I'm getting mad. And, you know, and finally in the story, somebody was bold enough to go, yo, hey, buddy, you need to watch your kids. What is wrong with you? You're like, and he said, I'll go, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He says, we just came from my hospital. My wife, their mom passed away. And, so, and, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, oh, my God. You know, and you just wish you had never, ah. Uh. The truth is, sometimes, for some of us, often, our judgment or our, our in, insight is mistaken. So why, if it so seldom works, if it almost never works well, never responds well, why do we keep using correction by criticism? It's pretty simple. Because focusing on somebody else's mistakes is better than anybody looking at ours. See, bringing to light something that they're doing makes my mistakes and my frailties less conspicuous. In fact, sometimes pointing out what somebody does wrong makes me feel a little more right. I feel somewhat more morally superior. Which is why I find it kind of frustrating when I'm kind of criticizing someone out loud and, and, and uh, a woman that I've lived with for a long time says, uh, yeah, but we did that. Yep, yeah, we did. We did. But it's so much more clear when it's somebody else's issue, isn't it? In fact, after a while, you start to learn that the clearer it seems to you, the more you go, wait, 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 <laughs> let me triple check this. Whether we do it out loud or whether we do it just in our heads, because that's what Christians do, right? You'd never say it out loud. You just judge them quietly. <laughs> whether you do it out loud or you do it in your head, Jesus says, don't judge others. There's a better way. There's a way to live in the kingdom. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 7. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured by you. So, wow. Is Jesus saying here that God is going to judge you the way you judge other people. I mean, I, I, I took it like that for a long time. What's he saying? Well, I guess we know he's not saying that. We know that the gospel says that God judges us all guilty of sin, and when we've trusted Christ, that payment has, that, 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 that guilty verdict has been removed. The offense, the payment has been made. We know he's not judging us based on how we judge others. We, that's not how God works. In Matthew 18, Jesus instructed his followers that when they see a brother or sister who is making an important mistake, that we should go to them and confront them. The book of Galatians says that whenever we approach someone, another brother or sister, who's making a, what we think is a mistake or, or needs a correction, that when we do approach them, we should do it with humility. And grace, be gentle. So he's not saying don't have any judgment about other people because otherwise God's going to judge you that way. In fact, what he's saying is we should not judge others in that negative way because, well, here's the first point. When you judge others, they will tend to judge you right back. That's what he's saying. The way you judge others is the way they're going to judge you. No one likes to be judged. So if you and I don't like to be judged, Jesus says, we would be wise to stop judging. You don't understand just how wrong they are. Jesus goes, oh, I think I do. What I'm saying is, hmm, pause for a minute. Because here's the point. What Jesus is saying is, judged people, judge people. If you find yourself being judged, it's time for a little evaluation. It's almost poetic justice, isn't it? 
Jesus says, look, you're going to get it back in the same measure you dish it out. God is so smart. The second reason not to judge, Jesus says, is this. He says, you may not be well equipped for the job. Let's read on. This is, this is such a great passage. Verse 3. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, the way this is written, probably Jesus' audience would, would have been just laughing, chuckling. Like, the, the picture, the word picture is just outstanding. Like, oh, you got a little something, and you come through this huge plank eye, right? There was a band called, a Christian band called Plank Eye. You know, let me help you with that. It's whack. You, you know, you can almost you imagine a Carol Burnett's, you know, skit or something, like whatever. He says, and you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, hey, buddy, let me help you with that speck in your eye. All the while, there's a plank in your own eye. Jesus says, another good reason not to judge somebody is you may not be well equipped. Right? Then you wonder why people, oh, you did more damage than you solved. Yeah, I would think so with a plank sticking out of your eye. Now, we've got to ask ourselves a question. What exactly is the speck? What exactly is the plank? I mean, it seems in the construction of this passage that the speck and the plank are actually the same thing, same material, just more of it over here. First reading, sometimes people get the impression that he's talking about sin. And if that were the case, what he would be saying is, oh, none of us can help anybody else with sin in their lives until we have gotten rid of all of the sin in our lives. Well, that ain't going to happen. Is that what he's saying? It's obviously, it can't be about sin. Instead, I think it has to do with our awareness that something needs correcting. Before we go trying to help someone else, see what needs to be corrected in their lives, Jesus is saying, we should be sure that we are aware and dealing with what needs correcting in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but the people that have been the biggest help to me in my life, they were not perfect. I never expected them to be. But what I found most encouraging is that they were doing in their lives exactly what they were asking me to do, which is to take a, a new look and maybe make a change. And if they are doing that, I have no problem with them asking me to do it. What's funny is, whether it's a speck or a plank, it does kind of depend on your perspective, right? Something out here is small. You stick it in your eye, it's going to look like a plank. Have you ever had something in your eye? Ah, ah, there's this huge thing in my eye. It's, it's teeny. What Jesus is saying is, don't be that person. Sorry, I skipped that, but we'll come back to it. Don't be that person, that person who is so fast to tell everybody else what they should do and seems to be clueless about any change themselves. Jesus gives a third reason for not judging. And this is interesting in verse 6. Now, let's just read it. And then I want, you, I want to ask you what you think. Right after he says that, he says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. That's a phrase you've heard, right? Pearls before swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, trample you under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Huh? Okay, this is why some of you, like, you read the Bible, and you're, then you get to a spot like this, and you kind of go, ah, uh, hmm. I'm with you. Even in preparing this, I stopped and went, is this maybe dropped in here by mistake? What's he saying? Especially when it comes to judging others. He's just been addressing, like, I've, I've got this truth that I think will help you. But I can't share it unless I'm at least aware that I'm having to work on things too. And then he talks about Something sacred. Now, let's, let's unpack this for a minute. First of all, there's something called a chiasm here, which we just typically don't understand literarily anymore. But 
if, if, and I can't really draw it, but like, so if we were to look at this, it's sort of, um, it talks about the dogs at the beginning, and then the pigs, and then it talks about something the pigs would do, and then it ends with the, something the dogs would do. Okay, so it's kind of A, B, B, A kind of a, a setup. So don't give the dogs what's sacred, or they might tear you to pieces. And don't give pearls to pigs, or they may trample you under their feet. Big help, right? Now you understand it. <laughs> Not at all. So let's ask ourselves, first of all, what is sacred and pearls parallel? Same, same idea. Whatever he's talking about, it's sacred, it's pearls, it's precious, it's whatever. What, what in the context of what Jesus has been saying could be construed as sacred or helpful or precious? And I'm going to suggest it is our care and concern that expresses, like, we, we want to help somebody with a problem. That's what's precious here in this little scenario. Now, so what he's saying is, you know, if you, what happens when you give, now, first of all, dogs. Um, in Jesus' day, people didn't have dogs as pets. If you've been to other countries where dogs just, uh, we've got a lot of our neighbors who are from India. And, and in most of their, where they came from, dogs are, are wild scavengers. And so, you know, our little puppies up front and, and our neighbors are like, oh, 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 you know, afraid. Because where they come from, any dog could just turn on you. If you had something in your hand, I mean, imagine, imagine a seagull with teeth and four feet, okay? <laughs> they just jump. So that's the dog that's being talked about here. Would you get, what happens when you give a dog something sacred? Like, oh, okay, Fido, I've got a gift for you, okay? Here's a picture of my mom. <laughs> I can't believe you tore that up. You, you, get, you get the gist? What you would say is, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't think that dog is going to appreciate or even know what to do with what you're giving it. Everybody knows that pigs will eat anything. But when you throw a bunch of pearls, something precious, you throw them in, guess what happens? Pigs can't digest pearls. They benefit nothing even though you, I'm giving you the best pearls I can find, guys, the pigs are going to be upset. In fact, so upset that if they see food behind you, they're going to trample you. You get the idea? So what Jesus is really saying here, first of all, isn't it neat the way he says it in a way that makes us think? But now when we unpack what, we, what he said, it's simple. What he says is this. Don't correct someone when they are not able to receive it. Isn't that great? What he's saying is, when they're not ready to listen, now, how do you know that? Well, boy, that would be another whole sermon, right? I mean, but if, if we just pause to go, first of all, are they in a place where they would even be ready for this? One great sign that somebody might be ready to hear what you have to say is they will ask you. I don't know how many times I have to think to myself, you know, I... Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, they haven't asked. I want so much to give them advice. I mean, every, I've got the answers for everything. Yeah, you know. I mean, like, <laughs> they haven't asked. They have not asked. Now, we're right at the end here, and, and something happens that... All we're going to have time to do today is, is suggest something for your attention. After that pig and dog comment, in, in, if you look at your Bible, it probably the next verse probably has a new heading. The heading above this section probably says, don't judge others. And now starting in verse 7, it will say, about prayer. And this is what, this is what the next pa passage says. Ask and it will be given. Oh, is that familiar? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. You've quoted that, right? You've heard it. It's in songs. It's in posters. You go to uh, Hobby Lobby. You know, it's, it's like 16 different little plaques you can buy. Okay, I know. 
And, and almost all the commentators just simply assume now Jesus is talking about prayer, which he obviously is, but I can't help but notice how abruptly he stopped talking about judging and then suddenly he jumps into prayer. Could there be a connection between judging and prayer? Oh. He's just said there are some good reasons not to judge and he ended with saying, they're not ready for it. Have you, ever had, have you ever watched somebody's life come unraveled and you just go, and you can do nothing? Because you know they're not even asking. <laughs> and it's so hard. What do you do? Is it possible that Jesus said this next on purpose? And so I want you just to consider this as we close. What can we do? How can we correct someone, help someone without judging them? I, th I think we've established that helping other people with things that are kind of falling apart in their lives, it's a good thing to do. And yet, our tendency will be to do it and feel better about ourselves and judge them. We don't want to do that. So how do we help without judging? Three points. First, ask. Them? Oh, God. Ask God to help you know how to respond to this person. Pray for the person that you're thinking about. Now, this is what's really humbling, is we are willing to put it all on the line, have a confrontation, and tell them what they're doing wrong. We don't, however, have time to pray for them. That's kind of hypocritical, isn't it? What if it was a rule? You can unload on them. You just have to pray for them every day for seven days in a row. All right, <laughs> whatever it takes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them, I'm going to, right? I need to begin to pray. Don't pray for them like about the issue. Just pray for them. God, would you bless them? God, would you strengthen them? What it, is it possible that praying for someone before we go unload our, our gospel gun on them is going to change our perspective? Secondly, seek. Maybe before you unload on them, you might want to spend some time with them. Hey, let's grab lunch. Have you ever done that? Now, it's, it's, it's unique with pastors, right? I say, hey, let's grab lunch. And we go to lunch, and you're like, what? <laughs> okay. Either I'm in trouble, or you want me to be in charge of something. Because <laughs> I'm up to date on my giving. So <laughs> that's the main reason people give. Like, they don't want to have the talk, right? <laughs> you know? I don't know what people get. <laughs> anyway, seek, spend time with them. Listen to their story. How many times did you think you knew what that person did until you hear the way they grew up and you're like, oh, I, oh. and it changed it. Well, anyway, what did you want to say? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> no, nothing. You are amazing. Just the, yeah, <laughs> seek and then knock. When you've done all that, then you actually... Hey, um, could I talk to you about something? Uh, and it's important to me, and it, it, I'm, I'm not sure how you're going to feel about it. Could I talk to you about something? Now, ask, seek, knock, great instruction about prayer. But I just find it so interesting that it works so well with judging. And I have a hunch that if we would ask, seek, and knock, we would almost never judge people the way Jesus is describing judging. Now, some of us excel. We could still whip out a judgment once in a while, just out of the clear blue because we're good at it. But I'll bet you it would put an end to a lot of it. And I think Jesus knew that. By the way, how did Jesus hang around so many sinners and not judge them, instead love them? Because he loved them. What they were doing was of the secondary concern. By the way, how does he end this whole passage? It's interesting. He ends it with what we know as the golden rule. Verse 12. So, in everything. Now, what's he summing up? I think it's okay to go all the way back through all the judging and then ask, seek, knock. In everything including you correcting somebody, helping them. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. 
boom. For this sums up the law and the prophets. It's actually pretty simple. You go ahead and judge someone else the way you like to be judged. Uh, uh, Never. There you go. Jesus says that this kind of living is possible when we live in the kingdom. When we keep his perspective, you, if you've trusted Christ, you are loved and accepted unconditionally. He's still working on you, so don't be surprised or offended that he's also still working on her. And because our heavenly Father is in complete control of this, he will get through to her when it's the right time. But he won't do it against her will. So until she's ready, he won't. Maybe you should take a, a lesson. Maybe I should learn. Jesus says, nobody likes to be judged. And everybody who judges gets judged. Don't judge. Instead, ask. Seek. And if necessary, knock. To live a life without judging being judged or judging. What are we going to do with all the extra time? (laughs) Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you keep inviting us to live in your kingdom. Jesus, you came to say, my Father loves, my Father forgives, he is eager to bless, and you told us that the kingdom is near. This issue of judging others, sometimes it has become such a deeply grained habit with us. It's our way of coping with our feelings of inadequacy. And the more we are offended by everyone else around us, we're too busy to actually do the inventory personally that you're asking for. But if we could begin to live judging others less. Then perhaps we put the attention where you want it to go as we examine our own hearts. And we can do that safely because you already know it's there and you still love us. So we are not going to be condemned. We are not going to be cast out. There is no shame connected with this. And what I have observed When you have placed people in my life who who are clearly on a regular basis checking their own heart, checking their own behavior, they are doing the work on themselves. I have no fear, no concern about asking them for input in my life. And that's precisely what you're saying. So Jesus, thanks for offering to us a life that is free from judging others. Help us to enter into that kingdom this week, and I ask it in Jesus' precious name.